it's appropriate for Matt to end on global warming because another reason that this idea about framing resonated for me based upon my own personal background was that even as I was getting into studying Matt's research, I just completed another book of my own about the relationship between hurricanes and global warming. And that book ended up providing a case study of how the rules of scientific debate change once scientific information gets swept up by the media and by the political system, and how important framing is in that context. And I'd like to, in brief, share that story with you, because I think it's a very instructive tale, showing both how scientists who are unfamiliar with the media can really get burned by it, but it also ends as a more hopeful story. So the issue of the relationship between hurricanes and global warming has actually a long scientific history, but it wasn't until the 2005 dramatic hurricane season in the Atlantic that it kind of exploded to public attention. And that was because not only did we have four Category 5 storms, not least of them Katrina, but there were 27, 28 total storms in the Atlantic, so many that former National Hurricane Center director Max Mayfield likes to joke that they had to start naming them after fraternities. And so we had Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, and so forth and so on. Amid all of this, this record year, not one but two scientific studies came out in leading journals saying that hurricanes had measurably intensified on average, and it was, this was closely correlated with rising temperatures of the ocean at the sea surface, and therefore by implication, global warming. One study from MIT's Carey Emanuel showing an increase in the power dissipation of hurricanes closely correlated with rising sea surface temperatures, and another study by Peter Webster and colleagues um, from Georgia Tech showing just an increase in the number of Category 4 and 5 hurricanes. Meanwhile, even as scientific studies were saying that hurricanes were intensifying, what did we see but the most intense hurricane ever recorded in the Atlantic. This is Hurricane Wilma, featuring what the forecasters call the dreaded pinhole eye on October 19th, 2005. Minimum sea level pressure, 882 millibars, the lowest ever measured in the Atlantic basin. As a result of both the weather and the science, the media coverage pattern to this issue, the relationship between hurricane and global warming, resembles, kind of, the wind speed measurements of a tropical storm that meanders sort of weakly along for several days and then suddenly hits a patch of warm water and rapidly intensifies to category four and five strength. Uh, as a result, there's so much attention to this issue that the cyclone, the image of a cyclonic storm itself becomes a new symbol of global warming, and I think that's epitomized by the poster for Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Now, I call this an inconvenient poster because uh, hurricanes rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, and I'm not sure what Al Gore was going for here. I, I showed them this in Melbourne, Australia at the Bureau of Meteorology, and they got a real kick out of it when I said Al Gore was maybe doing a shout out to the southern hemisphere. But <laughs> It doesn't really matter, right, because which way the storm is rotating. This is what Matt calls a frame device, and in this case, um, it's the Pandora's box frame, again, or perhaps Pandora's smokestack. And Al Gore is signifying by this image that hurricanes equal global warming and that you should be alarmed. But in fact, in the world of science, a huge battle was going, over, going on over the validity of the results that I've just cited. And so as a result, we get a kind of case study of what happens when you add a vehement scientific debate together with a media feeding frenzy. And what happens is pretty shocking to scientists. So journalists start mucking around on this issue. They cover it even in 2006 when there's not a lot of um, dramatic weather, unlike 2005 in the tropics. And it's, they cover it when there aren't a lot of scientific papers coming out initially that follow on uh, the previous papers. So what did the journalists do? They started focusing on drama, individual personalities of scientists, and conflict. And this was a, and this exacerbated the argument between the scientists, and the fight actually got quite personal, I think, in large part because of media coverage. And it's epitomized by a Wall Street Journal front page story where the journalists are apl journalists applying a conflict frame and here's the headline, hurricane debate shatters civility of weather science. Worsened by global warming, spats are so tempestuous, sides are barely talking, charge of brain fossilization. So it's a journalistic controversy frame, and the, and the message that the public gets also has a strong element, again, of this familiar scientific uncertainty frame because scientists are fighting, scientists disagree. What's a common citizen supposed to think? We don't know. Um, and the scientists themselves were really shocked, not only by the media feeding frenzy, but also by the tensions that arose as a result of it. And as the Webster team later wrote in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, even senior scientists are ill-prepared for their first major experience with mixing politics, science, and the media. But finally, and happily, I think, the scientists involved in the hurricane global warming debate 
on both sides of the issue actually reached across the aisle and decided to actively try to reframe the issue in July of 2006. They released a joint statement in which they defined what Matt and I would call a middle way frame. So it wasn't about scientific uncertainty anymore. It wasn't about conflict because they were agreeing and they said, while the debate on hurricanes and climate change is of considerable scientific soci and societal interest and concern, it should in no event detract from the main hurricane problem facing the United States, the ever-growing concentration of population and wealth in vulnerable coastal regions. So in other words, give us five, 10 years, we'll sort out this scientific argument, but in the meantime, uncertainty doesn't have to translate into inaction because there are some branded obvious things we can do to protect ourselves from the hurricanes of today um, we are very exposed, we are very vulnerable, no matter what global warming is doing. And then if the storms get 5, 15, 25, 50% worse, and once we figure that out, we can add to our defenses, but let's just get ourselves ready for the storms of the present. So it's a middle way approach, and it gets us out of the trap of scientific uncertainty and lets us proceed forward with productive policy action. I think there are two lessons here, and the first one is, is a lesson, they're both lessons for scientists, but the first one is that it can happen to you. Who knows what tomorrow's controversy is going to be. Who knows where the next media feeding frenzy is going to erupt? It may be your field, and will you be ready for that to happen? And the second message is that now more than ever, as the publication of these two studies in the middle of hurricane season shows, scientists simply by doing research and then publishing it, have the power to drive public discourse and to shape societal decision making. And science is only going to become more crucial, not less to decision making, to policy in the future, in the 2008 election cycle, and beyond. In this context, we have a problem because many, not all, but many scientists do still cling to this idea that they can just put the facts out there and the facts will speak for themselves and we'll all be better off for it. But the evidence that Matt and I have presented, I think, overwhelmingly shows that the facts do not speak for themselves. And if the facts are all we have, we won't necessarily be better off because the facts are going to get attacked by advocates. They're going to get twisted by politicians. They're going to get misrepresented or not covered or excessively covered in the media. They're going to get, in some cases, suppressed by government agencies, which was the problem in the Republican war on science. Scientists and science defenders, we should be outraged by this. We should complain about it. But at some point, we're also going to have to go beyond that. We're going to have to take active steps to counter and prevent it and to ensure that knowledge translates because we can't just assume that it will. So now I'll turn it over to Matt to end quickly with some suggestions for how we can do that. 